surprise, Sir Pooh de Bear. <laughs> he pays me extra for that part. Not that much extra, he just likes to do it. <laughs> I'm truly delighted to be here in Missoula, very specifically. As a boy growing up in New York City, Montana was a magical name. And my brother and I dreamed about running away and being cowboys. And Montana, Wyoming, Utah. Nobody told us about how cold it gets. <laughs> I still, still like the name, I still have memories that actually belong to friends of mine. Um, old friends of mine have taught here in the 1980s in general. One was Ray Carver, who became a very well-known writer, and one, his buddy, old friend of mine, named Chuck Kinder. And Chuck did become as famous as Ray, but he lives in Pittsburgh in the only haunted house, officially haunted house I know. Um, they bought the house from the family and was, were told at the time that from time to time an ancestor, a great aunt, might drop by to visit. Um, not to worry about it, she was very, wasn't at all malevolent, she just liked to check out the house, see how it's doing. And my friend Diane, Chuck's wife, was told that she'd know if the ancestor was in the house by the strong smell of vanilla, which I promptly stole and stuck into Tamsin, which is a ghost story. And Diane's told me that she smelled the vanilla a few times, and once she thought she saw something white and filmy whisking up the shit stairs. She wouldn't swear to it, but she thought she had. Anyway, every time I've stayed there, I've left the door open, just in hopes. Nothing's happened so far, but I live in hope. And Chuck told me about the Missoula adventure where a very well-known writer from New York, John Cheever, came to visit the university for, for a week or so. And they determined that all, all four of them, Chuck and Ray and their wives, that they were going to take John Cheever to dinner. Well, they hadn't, either one of them, um, checked their bank accounts for some while. They were. During those days, they, were, they both drank a lot. And so when Ray handed in his, his credit card to pay for the elaborate meal that given John Cheever the works, it came back rejected. OK, it's up to Chuck. And Chuck handed in his card, and it didn't simply get rejected. It came back cut into four pieces. I, you know, I've never had that happen. And I asked, what did you do? And Chuck looked around, although we were in his house, said, we made a run for it. And Diane had the car at the, at the curb with the engine running. And it was kind of like pulling off a bank robbery. But we got away with it. And that's a memory of Missoula that isn't even mine. <laughs> but I still like to think about it. The night, the night when two famous authors rips off a restaurant to feed another famous author. I love it. <laughs> At this point, uh, oh, by the way, if any of you know a splendid writer named James Lee Burke, who lives around here, I know, please tell him that I've admired his work for years. We've corresponded a bit, and that I'd love to have seen him, love to have met him. Anyway, at this point, I'd love to throw this open, so as not to keep you from the movie, to any questions you might want to ask about the movie, about the book, about whatever it is I've been doing for the last 50 years. <coughs> and I urge you, please ask questions, no matter how foolish they may seem to you, because you don't know foolish questions. If you don't start, until he I starts start. asking. I, I will ask really dumb questions, unless someone begins this. So who ha you have a question, good, you spared him. <laughs> Can you tell us about Two Hearts, the sequel? To could, could you hear the question? Can you tell us about Two Hearts, the sequel story to the last year's book? You might want to, since it's partly your doing. Well, we should tag team. All right, go ahead. All right. <laughs> Who here knows there's a sequel story? OK, Here's the, here are the facts. In 2004, Peter wrote a story called Two Hearts. It is a coda to The Last Unicorn. It's a beautiful book, beautiful story, novelette. It won the Hugo Award. It won the Nebula Award. It was nominated for the World Fantasy Award. It's an amazing story. And uh, it's the story he spent 30 years telling people adamantly he would never write. 38 years. 38 years. <laughs> and here's how it came to pass. We will do this as a team. One day, 
We had just finished the audiobook of The Last Unicorn, which he read, and we were doing a promotional release for his appearance in a show in Atlanta, and my hands typed, just typed on their own. He always blames his hands. My hands. <laughs> And the first 3,000 people to buy the audiobook will receive a free, never-before-published story <coughs> set in the world, The Last Unicorn. And I thought to myself, that's a wonderful idea. He'll never say yes. <laughs> so I called him, and I pitched him on the idea, and he made a sound. <laughs> the actual sound had fewer vowels and more consonants, yeah. and was much angrier. That's true, it was a long, long ago. And, and then he explained to me that there would never be a sequel to The Last Unicorn. He was asking for 38 years, never, never, never. It was a young man's work, he wasn't that person anymore. He'd said everything he had to say, no sequels. And when he ran down, I said, you will note I never used the word sequel. I said, set in the world of. It's a big place, you're a writer, there must be other stories there. And he made that sound again. <laughs> And then he hung up on me. Seemed the only thing to do. And I figured that was it. And then two and a half weeks later, in my email, there was this untitled story attached to a, to a letter from him, a note from him. The note simply said, well, here it is. I don't know if it's any good. And I read it, and I spent the last three pages of the manuscript crying like a baby. And I called up and said, you realize you, you, this is the sequel. I mean, you, you just this is too wonderful to, to stop. This character, this, this girl who's the center of this story, you need to tell the rest of her story. And he said, um, no, now no, he's that, lying. That was a mumble, I know. No, no, what he said, this is the tone of voice he said, I know. Matter of degree. I exaggerate ever so slightly. And I said, and if you write the novel that this implies, it will be the sequel to the last interview you spent 38 years telling people you'd never write. No. And then he said, I even know how it starts, so I guess I'll have to do it. So someday, there may yet be yet another novel to follow. That's how Two Hearts came to pass. It's a wonderful story. The book that it's in, The Line Between, his collection, The Line Between, is out of print as of three weeks ago. There'll be a new hardcover coming out from us in a few months. Again, two remembers will buy it cheap because we didn't have it here. If you want Two Hearts, that's the best way to buy it. Yes? What inspired you to write The Last Unicorn? What inspired me to write? I always tell people, The Last Unicorn had nothing to do with inspiration and everything to do with desperation. <laughs> <coughs> I was sharing a cabin in the Berkshires at the age of 23 with my lifelong buddy, a painter named Phil Sigunik, also 23, and also devoted to what he'd done since he was five. He was always the painter and I was always the writer. And we decided we'd spend the summer being really professional. He'd go out every day and work in a landscape that he had in mind. And I would write something. I didn't know what, because I published one book already, had another one rejected. I really didn't know quite where I was or what I should do next. And Phil would go off on his motor scooter every day with a lunch packed and that huge landscape strapped up behind him. And there I was in the cabin by myself. I had to have something to show him when he came back with more paint on the canvas. And I had to have pages. And I started, finally, with the line, the unicorn lived in a lilac wood and she lived all alone. Great, now what? <laughs> and that's the way it came that summer, um, line by line, just so I had something to show Phil when he got back from a day spent painting. We talked about it years, years later, and not, not too long ago, and he told me, I hated that damn landscape. I would have quit in a week, but you were back at the cabin writing this book. <laughs> and that's exactly the way it happened. Uh, while we wait for Connor to get back, is anyone still missing a raffle ticket? This is a free raffle. You want a ticket. Hmm? Okay, keep your hands up. Uh, and, and I guess and if, you, if you have a question, <laughs> just jump up and down. Also raise your hand. <laughs> when, yes. When, when you first saw the movie, how did you feel about it, especially in comparison to what you had written? Did it, did it fill your desires in that way? I was absolutely stunned when I saw the movie. The reason for that is that I hated everything Rankin and Bass had ever done. I hated Frosty the Flipping Snowman. <laughs> I hated what they'd done to The Hobbit, The Return of the King. In fact, when the guy whose credit is up there as the associate producer, Michael Walker, told me that he'd made a deal with Rankin and Bass, 
and he mumbled it, he knew how I felt. <laughs> I literally banged my head on the roof of his VW bug and screamed to them, Rankin and Bass, why don't you just go all the way and sell it to Hanna-Barbera? <laughs> and Michael's mumbled response was, they were next. <laughs> because nobody wanted the last unicorn. And so when, when I saw it, so much the best thing Rankin and Bass had ever done with real <coughs> actors, and real composed, real music, and my script filmed the way I'd written it, I could hardly talk. I didn't know what to say. It took me some viewings before I could finally get my, my mind around the fact that they'd really done the best they possibly could. Right there. That's a funny thing. I, again, I didn't know what to expect. They shot the works on that bull. Um, I was overwhelmed like anybody else, but the funny thing is that I know where the bull comes from. I don't always know about some of my characters, but the bull comes out of a painting done by an ex-husband of my favorite cousins. She married at 18, I think to get out of the house, and she married a Spanish painter named Marcial Rodriguez. And Marcial, looking for work that summer in New York, Electa was 18, I was 17, um, got a job putting a fashion show together. And he roped me into helping him nail down the runways, all the physical aspects of the show. And I wasn't doing anything that summer, so it was fine with me. And at the end of the summer, Marcial couldn't pay me, of course, but he gave me a painting of his own that I have had since 1956, when I was 17. It's a painting of unicorns fighting bulls. Oh, then they really wanted the bulls oil ray on that bull. <laughs> it's got a case. And if you want to see that painting, if you own either the DVD or the Blu-ray of The Last Unicorn, the, sent the 2007 edition on, that's in the gallery. It's in the special features. Mm -hmm. So who's got a question? Who's got a question? Who's got a question? Right there. Um, as a writer, what are you most proud of? I guess what I'm proudest of was part from the fact that I actually, actually raised a family writing, which is unlikely. That's, that's what actors say about this, say it like this. You can make a killing in the theater. You just can't make a living. It's really like that with writing. Every once in a while, somebody strikes it rich. But most people, most of us, have some kind of backup job that quite often they don't particularly like and we write late at night or whenever we can. So I'm very rare in the sense that I made enough, at least, to feed my children. And if I have to pick one thing that I'm proud of, that's it. Beyond that, it's individual characters. I'm immensely proud of Molly Grew, because I don't know where she came from. I really don't. I was too young to create her, and I was too young to know what her life had been like. I can only figure that the universe felt, okay, you're really knocking yourself out over this. You really are trying, okay, this is a freebie. Here she is, just don't expect it as a regular thing. Uh, just think of Molly as my gift. was the old writer the book is dedicated to, Robert Nathan, who never even noticed the dedication when I sent him the book. He read right past it in manuscript and called me to say, this is going to be the book people know who don't know that you ever wrote anything else. Because the same thing had happened to him. You're going to be stuck with this, he said, the way I'm stuck with Portrait of Jenny, which was a book he wrote when, about the time I was born. And it was made into a movie, a very successful one, and an Italian opera, and the stage musical, and it overshadowed every one of his 40 other novels. We used to talk about that a lot. And he said, same thing will happen to you. You write books you like better than The Last Unicorn, and nobody will know them. Um, books will go out of print. It's just what happens. And you may never write another one that anybody pays much attention to. He said, I know I wrote better books than, than Portrait of Jenny. And nobody knows them. We go round and round with that, and we always come to the same conclusion. It does beat the hell out of not being remembered at all, doesn't it? 
He has written some other things. I'm going to flash a few out for you that you may. Who here remembers a television show called Star Trek Next Generation? He wrote one of the best episodes of that, the episode called Sarek, where Spock's father can no longer control his emotions and has to mind meld with Picard. That was his episode. He wrote the whole thing. Came up with the idea, the whole thing. Uh, who here remembers the 19th century? Yes. All right, all right. Trekkie reference, Trekkie joke. What's this? Vulcan politician. Okay. Uh, sorry. You had to get that. I had to get that. Uh, there's rarely so many of you sitting in one place for that. Um, he also, who remembers the 1978 Ralph Bakshi animated Lord of the Rings? Yes. Peter wrote the screenplay for that. And that movie, that movie was seen in New Zealand by this 17-year-old punk kid named Peter Jackson who'd never read Tolkien. <laughs> and it made him go read Tolkien, and you know what happened from there. Well, so, I like remembering, I think that the movie is My Adventure with Gracie Ralphie, but I like remembering the very sweet guy who played Gollum, the, the definitive voice of Gollum. His name is Peter Woodthorpe, an English actor. We became friends and used to sneak off in the recording studio to have lunch. And I really do believe he saved my life because we were leaving the restaurant, heading back to the studio, and I had forgotten, although I certainly knew because that's where I learned to drive, I'd forgotten that in the English drive on the left side. And you need to pay attention to traffic coming from the left. I walked straight into the path of a bus and Peter grabbed me, snatched me back to the curb, and looked at me, just said, we lose more Americans like that. <laughs> One more credit. Now, this is a secret. Almost nobody knows about this. He didn't write any of the episodes, but he did write the show Bible for a certain animated series. And when I mean show Bible, I mean he came up with a, like 90% of the basic concepts and the characters and the character names. Who here remembers Captain Planet and the Planeteers? No, the whole thing, the rings, the power part. I have completely forgotten that show. Connor had to remind me. <laughs> he, was, he was all work for hire, so his name's not on it at all, but he came up with most of that. Okay, who's got another question? I see an arm somewhere. Yes, you. She said, I want to be an author. Do you have any tips for me? My basic tip for everybody, and I'm giving it out a lot, is show up for work. Because most people, are off, I've met an awful lot of talented people who I think could have done this well or better than I, but they couldn't sit still for a certain period of time every day. Every day. You don't have to write all day, every day. But you need to have a certain, certain amount of time, an hour, two hours, set out during which nobody can bug you. Nobody can reach you. In fact, you're, sp you're spending your time at work. And it's easy to do that when the work comes easily. It's a lot harder when nothing is happening. Some days are like that. Your imagination just goes dead. You can't think of a thing to write. And you still have to stay there. Because it has to be a habit. It's very much like going to the gym, exercising your imagination, which is a muscle. And that's the first thing I know about writing. And it's just as hard for me sometimes as it would be for anybody else. Writers love to stall. And now there's so many ways of stalling um, on the internet. There are perfectly good reasons. I've got to look this fact up. I've got to look this person up historically. And the next thing you know, you're two hours away from what you had in mind. I'm serious. Um, ideally, when you're writing, you shouldn't have the laptop around at all. But mainly, you just need to go to work. Okay, who's got? How about you? Yeah. Um child, what I loved about the movie the most was the music that really stayed with me all the time. Did you have any, any input or anything to do with that with America and Jeremy Wynn? Did, did you hear the question? Okay. The question was, as a child, he was really moved by the music, and he's asking Peter if he had anything to do with the music or with America singing it. Not a thing, and the story goes with it, <laughs> because I did know that they'd gotten Jimmy Webb to write the music, and I was delighted. You know, Webb's a first-class songwriter. But I'm very glad that I didn't know that they had gotten America to sing the soundtrack. Because at that time, all I knew of America was that bloody song, Horse With No Name, which I hated more than I have ever hated a song. And my daughters were constantly playing, singing it around the house like I couldn't stand it. It's, it's a miracle they survived. Seriously. 
And of course, the soundtrack's wonderful, and they sing beautifully on it. But I'm glad I didn't have any input there. <laughs> Who here owns a copy of the soundtrack? Okay. Here's some news for you. The story goes with that one, too. Here's some news for you. Your soundtrack is illegal. They have always been illegal. It was only a German import. And here's the story. The German record company that released it did not know that the man who brought them the master and made the deal had no legal right whatsoever to make that deal. He collected the royalties for decades illegally. In 2007, rumors started to circulate, they, and he, he got out. He basically made them buy him out, and no one knows where he is now. They can't find the guy. They now know it was illegal. They've pulled it from circulation. There's going to be a new remastered soundtrack coming out next year with all the music. The soundtrack only had 40 minutes because that's what would fit on a vinyl record. Yeah. But there's 70 minutes of music in the movie. The new release next year will have all of it. Oh. And tour members, they'll be in a tour edition with more stuff on it. Yes. When next year? They, uh, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> if I could tell you the date right now, I would. OK, anybody else?